I live for the simple things, like how much this is gonna hurt. I want one. Be honest, every one of you has fantasized about using at least one weapon from the MCU. Who wouldn't want to try throwing Cap Shield? Heads up, try on Thanos' gauntlet. Or to see if they're worthy enough to lift Mjolnir. If I could give you any one weapon from the MCU, the only thing to know before you pick is which one is the best. Watch till the end where I'll decide the winner. It may just surprise you. What's life without a little controversy, huh? So let's start with the big weapon, the one you're all here for. That's right, Thanos' Infinity Gauntlet. The Infinity Saga spent the better part of a decade meticulously introducing us to how terrifyingly powerful each and every Infinity Stone was. Pretty much every other year, millions were put directly into harm's way because someone evil was toying with some unbelievable power they didn't understand. Then came Thanos, who decided to design himself a glove that could house each and every one of those all-powerful stones. This turned the already formidable Titan, who could throw hands with Hulk without breaking a sweat, into a greatest hit show of all the powers of bad guys past. I mean, in Endgame, the man had no stones at all and still took on the big three Avengers with a double-bladed sword that would make Darth Maul and Cloud Strife jealous. Once he gathered all the stones, he was even able to obliterate half of all life in the universe with a snap of his fingers. That power is not only most MCU villains could wish for, but most movie villains as well. Sauron, Darth Vader, and Voldemort would all have loved to borrow the glove for just a second. One of the first glimpses we got into the MCU's supernatural mythology was our quick glimpse into Odin's legendary war room. Not only did Odin's vault contain the casket of ancient winters and the destroyer, but a plethora of Marvel Easter eggs like the Infinity Gauntlet and the Eye of Agamotto. Thor Ragnarok turned this on its head by having Hela reveal most of it was fake for some reason. Don't feel too bad, Odin. All of us have bought something off eBay without reading the description first. Hela did shed some light on how great Odin used to be. Evidently, some of the weapons in the vault had some real value that we're likely to never know about. She showed us the secret history of Asgard as she and her father conquered the stars to build that golden throne he liked to sit on so much. Unfortunately, Thor burned the whole house down before we truly ever learned just what secrets Odin was holding back on us. For all we know, he was the most powerful guy in the entire MCU. Some fans even think that Thanos was waiting for his demise before he started taking matters into his own hands. Few superheroes out there are quite as attached as Thor is to his weapons. His entire first film was solely dedicated to his journey to prove himself worthy of his hammer. Say what you will about Cap and his shield, but he never spent an entire film dedicated to his love of his star-spangled frisbee. Mjolnir was once the weapon to end all weapons in the MCU. Every other Avenger even stood up to try and prove their worth to wield it. Then Thor's mean older sister showed up and ruined everything. Like many older siblings, Hela saw that Thor was having a lot of fun with his favorite toy and decided to break it just out of spite. This led Thor to build his own weapon that he didn't have to prove anything to wield. He took the power of an entire star on his back in order to build Stormbreaker, and the weapon did not disappoint. It was able to cut right through a blast from the Infinity Gauntlet and nearly ended Thanos before he had a chance to snap. If only Thor had better aim, he would have proven himself as the strongest Avenger once and for all. You had it, Thor! You finally had it! Oh, it was right there. If you're a giant vibranium robot that was literally designed by Iron Man to make the Avengers obsolete, how can you really get better? Well, what if you had like a thousand more of yourself, all linked to your own mind? Like a thousand fists that can overwhelm those puny human superheroes you hate so much? That's what Ultron had at his disposal when he planned on blowing a crater in the planet Earth. Frankly, I understand his overconfidence. Now that I think about it, he probably has the most embarrassing loss of any villain in the MCU. I mean, most villains just lost once, not 1,000 times all at once. Wakanda has quite the leg up on the rest of the world. Everyone else hoards tiny scraps of vibranium they can get their hands on, while Wakanda sits on a giant meteor full of the stuff. They have so much that Shuri has time to not only make giant flying cars, but specialized cat-themed battle armor for her big bro, the Black Panther. Unfortunately, we only got to see T'Challa use two suits during his far too short of a time in the MCU, but both would even make Batman jealous, the latest featured deck that stored kinetic energy for a powerful release. Shuri has big panther-shaped boots to fill, and designing herself a new killer Black Panther suit would be a good start. Wakanda forever! Everyone wants an Iron Man suit, 
That's what the plot of the first two Iron Man movies were about, and likely what the plot of the War Machine-centered Armor Wars will be about too. While the government seemed out of line the first time I saw Iron Man 2, on a rewatch of all the MCU films, I see their point. In the years following that film, there were several alien invasions, a few godly showdowns, and a Hydra takeover attempt. Literally, all of those scenarios could have been helped with a small army of Iron Man suits. We saw this in great deal during Iron Man 3, where Tony enlisted his entire wardrobe to help him take down a bunch of extremist guys. What could have been an Avengers-level threat to the president himself was once shotted by Tony alone with plenty of suits to spare. This wasn't even including his suit that was capable of trading punches with the Hulk. He topped that too by including specialized nanotech in his final suit that may have had a little bit of Shuri's help in its design. It's also worth mentioning that the suit just looks like a lot of fun to take a ride around in. Who wouldn't want to take it for a joyride, huh? While most weapons in the MCU are based on some sort of logic, even if it's comic book logic, Captain America's vibranium shield cuts right through stupid things like logic and physics. Somehow, no matter where Steve Rogers throws that shield, it always manages to bounce perfectly back into his hands like a big vibranium boomerang. While it's quite impressive, its defensive capabilities are even greater. Captain America is one of the more vulnerable Avengers, so it's fitting that he carries a shield to protect him from pretty much anything, including Thor's hammer. It seemed truly indestructible until Thanos cut it up like a Christmas ham. All dreams have to die sometime, I guess. It's kind of crazy to think that Peter Parker's superhero career started with basically his red and blue sweats and some modified goggles. Seriously, you know what's most impressive about the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man? That would be his sewing skills. Man! The Raimi spider suit was quite impressive for someone sewing in his aunt's basement. As far as the MCU goes, Tony Stark provided our Pete with quite the superhero glow-up when he took Parker out of his sweatpants and into his 21st century superhero attire. He provided him with all the best Stark tech that Hawkeye's been waiting years for. His own AI, custom web weapons, and a kill mode that frankly seems just like cheating. If that wasn't cool enough, Peter also got the Iron Spider suit, the most powerful we've seen in the MCU. This took Peter from a streetwise young superhero to a full-fledged Avenger who could take on intergalactic threats without having to be in his undies. As cool as all that was, none of it was as good as Peter's latest costume. Sure, it doesn't have extra legs coming out the back like the Iron Spider suit, but it's cooler because Peter designed it himself. From here on out, he won't be wearing anything with Stark's signature but his own. That's the Pete we know and love, the plucky scientist who could run Apple if he weren't so busy busting up bad guys and getting the snot beat out of him. Stephen Strange used to have a simple, stress-free life of being rushed into emergency rooms and save the lives of horribly injured people in surgeries, where even the slightest slip of a finger could mean a life or his career forever. Super stress-free stuff, you know? Well, compared to being a Sorcerer Supreme who has to fight interdimensional bad guys and big purple alien men, that is. Luckily, Stephen has more than a scalpel backing him up when the fate of the world is hanging in the balance. He has access to probably the greatest assembly of magical artifacts since the last scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Rings that can teleport, sentient flying capes, and necklaces that can bend time are only the tip of the magical iceberg that the Sanctum Sanctorum contains. As movies like Thor Ragnarok shows us, we've barely scratched the surface of what secrets Steven and the other Supremes have been storing all this time. Strange's battle with Thanos showed us that Steven has mastered weapons from the comics, like the Crimson Bands of Sidorak and a sword which may be Dragonfang. This combined with the Eye of Agamotto, the Sling Rings, and his Cloak of Levitation make him one decked out wizard. Unlike Odin, most of his stuff seems legit too. The Death Star from Star Wars Episode IV A New Hope was a game-changing piece of galactic engineering that took over a decade to construct and changed the nature of space warfare forever. Once it was destroyed, the evil engineers of the Star Wars universe seemed obsessed with creating another weapon capable of obliterating a planet. Rocket Raccoon could build a weapon that could do that with a box of scraps in Peter Quill's ship. The Hadron Enforcer was a device built with the capabilities of destroying a moon. If the intended target had enough mass, the payload would deliver Death Star levels of damage. It wasn't enough to make a Power Stone upgraded Ronin go down, but I imagine it would do a heck of a job on Alderaan without the crazy light show. It's a good thing that Rocket isn't evil, because Thanos would have some serious competition. Who would have thought that the smallest MCU franchise, Ant-Man, would have ended up being the most important part of the biggest MCU film, Endgame? Sure enough, silly little Scott Lang and his adventures through the microscopic universe were what saved the day in the end. It's funny because fans knew Ant-Man was going to defeat Thanos, but they were a little bit off their pitch. 
Luckily, we didn't have to watch Scott try to expand inside Thanos' intestines. You guys do know they make these movies for kids, right? Endgame did shine a light on something Hank Pym has known about for decades. The Pym Particles are perhaps the most dangerous scientific discovery of all time. Sure, Scott and Hope have basically only used them for cool capers and silly hijinks with ants that play the drums, but they are capable of reshifting all reality as we know it. Think about it. Our heroes were able to use Hank's technology to shrink into the past, create several alternate timelines, destroy those timelines, and undo the catastrophic events of Thanos' snap. These are just the ways heroes like the Avengers have used Hank's tech too. I can't imagine what someone with more nefarious intent could do with them. Really makes the stakes of the first Ant-Man, where Scott and the gang were fighting to keep the particles out of Hydra's hands, seem a lot more intense. If anyone shouldn't get time travel powers, it's Hydra. Or Deadpool, that was a bad idea. Looking back on the plot of Spider-Man Far From Home, Mysterio's plan wasn't all that great. Sure, fixing yourself to look like the superhero successor to Iron Man with fake superhero disasters you make using Stark tech looks great on paper. Quentin Beck had the whole world fooled into thinking he was a superhero, but like, what was he gonna do during a legit superhero disaster? Aliens vade New York like every other year in the MCU, and they would expect Mysterio to be all up in it. You might be able to fool an average Joe with your holographic light show, buddy, but Thor and an army of Chitari aren't so easily fooled into thinking you have superpowers. Luckily, Beck did have one incredibly powerful trick up his sleeve. Back in Age of Ultron, Tony Stark declared that he wanted to make a suit of armor around the world. Well, he succeeded obviously not learning the lesson from that movie or Captain America Winter Soldier. Tony made an enhanced form of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s Project Insight that was able to take out any person around the globe. Just like with Insight, a bad guy got control of it and nearly caused global mayhem. Luckily, Peter was able to take back control of Edith and save the day. Maybe he shouldn't have given those glasses to a teenager in the first place, huh? Falcon has spent most of his MCU screen time stuck in Captain America's shadow. Well, that's all about to change, because he's about to be a center stage hero thanks to Cap passing the torch. Er, shield, to Sam, in Anthony Mackie's new Disney Plus show Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Not to mention Outside the Wire and a whole bunch of other movies for 2021. Where does he find the time? Sorry, but he'll always be Papa Doc from 8 Mile to me, you know? <laughs> While inheriting the shield from Steve is a huge deal, his go-to weapon is worthy of a Disney Plus series by itself. His specialized Buzz Lightyear wings not only give him the ability to zoom through the sky, but they're also highly versatile in combat. Civil War showed us that they can be used as combat shields, missile launchers, and even has a drone named Red Wing. Aw, adorable. Hopefully the show sheds some light on the para rescue team where he got his fancy flyers. I would love to see the Vulture from Homecoming cameo as a commanding officer back in the day. I mean, how many people out there can be experts in jetpack wing combat, huh? Marvel fans know something deep down that even Kevin Feige would probably never admit to. If Yondu was in Infinity War, that movie would have lasted about 10 minutes long. Thanos shows up, Yondu would whistle, Thanos would drop, roll credits. I'm pretty sure that's the only reason they offed him in Guardians 2. That and that heartbreaking scene was Chris Pratt. <laughs> oh, he only had one spacesuit! See, Yondu's Yaka Arrow is one of those deceptively brilliant weapons that has the power to take down an entire battalion with just a few breaths. That was demonstrated twice in each of the Guardians films. First, he made Ronan Sakaran warriors look like plastic army men by decimating them with less effort than it takes for you to call your horse in Red Dead Redemption. In the second film, he topped that by obliterating an entire Ravager crew and the ship itself. Yondu is a one-man army, all without having to lift a finger. They showed that Stakar and the old-school Ravagers all drifted apart after Yondu was kicked out of the original group. Let's be honest, the reason why? That Yondu alone is Ravagers at 99% power. So yeah, no pressure, Kraglin. You better practice those whistling skills, bud. The Avengers are the greatest fighting force in the galaxy, despite the fact that the Earth is seemingly centuries behind the rest of the galaxy developmentally. Every alien race that's tried to conquer the planet has been sent packing. Just imagine a massive army of modern soldiers fighting against a strike force of half a dozen medieval-era soldiers. Then imagine those medieval soldiers send the entire army back where they came from. That's how incredible the Avengers are. They manage to do that through the incredible weapons, powers, and skills the team have amassed. This includes the one that everyone likes to ridicule, Hawkeye. Sure, compared to Thor and the Hulk, little Clint Barton might not seem like that big of a deal. When you just look at him individually as a hero, he's quite impressive. That's in no small part because of the dozens of trick arrows, explosives, and gadgets resting in his quiver. 
While many people fall Hawkeye for not carrying a firearm, he manages to do more with that special bow of his than he'd ever be able to do with a sniper rifle. Hopefully his Hawkeye Disney Plus series will cover how he was trained to be the greatest archer in the world. I'd like to imagine that there was one crazy general in the 90s who was in charge of all the bow and arrow, falcon wing, and ninja tech our mortal heroes are experts in. Now let's see that Disney Plus series.